What Marx focuses on is the process of production, what goes on inside the enterprise, where you work, nine to five, five days a week, when you go to work, what goes on there? How do people interact there? That's what he was interested in. That's what the three volumes of Capital, which is what his great achievement, well, I mean, he wrote a lot of other things too, but that was his great achievement. That's what he was interested in. How does production work? And he was very critical of the capitalist way of producing, and he was clearly in favor of an alternative. Wow. That means that socialism is now going back to Marx, finding in him this discussion of the enterprise, and redefining what socialism is, and I think it's worth your attention because it's going to be what socialism is for the rest of your lives. It's, to, it's the socialism of the 21st century, which is different from the socialism of the 19th and 20th centuries. Here we go. The critique of Marx can best be shown, please folks, don't get worried, I am now going to do economic arithmetic. This is always a dangerous moment because there are certain folks who have been trained in a certain way, nobody's fault. If you start writing arithmetic on the board, th their eyes glaze over, their brains go on vacation, and they get frightened. Don't. This is really very simple. Okay. In Marx's way of thinking, capitalism is easily representative, uh, represented in the following way of understanding what the process of production is. And because Marx is interested in human beings, and Marx is interested in how people relate to one another, because that's what he's concerned with, he's going to analyze what production, uh, what happens in production, in terms of labor, of this activity people give themselves to when they go to work, and how they relate to one another as they go about transforming nature into chairs and software programs and haircuts and everything else. Okay? So we're going to start this way. Every act of production makes use of some kinds of tools, equipment, raw material, whatever. For example, let's use a chair as an example. If you're going to make a chair, you need some wood and some glue and maybe some nails and a hammer and you, you, you get the idea. And all of those things that are used in production were made by human beings, labor, that's now available for us to use to make more things. Somebody did work a while ago to make the hammer, which I'm going to now use to make the chair. Somebody a while ago put together whatever needed to make the glue that I use and to cut the trees into the lumber that I use. And so we're going to use a simple EL, embodied labor. Every production makes use of embodied labor. Labor that's embodied in some product that was done earlier that's now an input to what we're doing now. Basically simple idea. Here comes another simple idea. With this embodied labor, labor embodied in all the tools, equipment, and raw material, production involves the addition of living labor, the worker. You, him, her, the people working. So we're going to call that living labor. Embodied labor plus living labor gives you the total labor in whatever we produce in an economy. It's real simple. Okay? You can say it in other words. There's the value of all the stuff we use up when we produce. Tools, equipment, and raw materials. And then there's the value added by the worker who uses those pieces of equipment to transform the raw material into the final. So this is nails, glue, lumber. This is the chair maker's effort. And the outcome is the chair. Okay? This is very simple. What is capitalism about? By some process, which we can talk about later, the embodied labor, the work done by working people in the past, becomes the private property of a few people. You know their names. They're called employers. They, got the, they didn't make this stuff. Absolutely not. Somebody else did. Workers. But those workers didn't get to keep what they produced. 
they lost what they produced and it became the property of somebody else. And that capitalist brings to the production process whatever it is he owns. Let's just say, just to make it simple, that it's worth a hundred. It doesn't matter what it is. Just a hundred of anything. So we know we're using up in making chairs 100 worth of hammers, nails, glue, lumber, all of that. And now the worker adds value to what he or she produces by transforming the lumber, nails, and glue into a new finished thing called a chair or a sofa or any other piece of output. Okay, and let's just to make it real simple say it's another hundred. And so the final chair is worth 200. I told you this would be easy. 100 plus 100 equals 200. Economists think this is an enormous achievement here, but most of you probably don't. The arithmetic is simple. Okay? Now let's follow the logic as Marx did. This is what a capitalist does. He brings 100 of what he's come to acquire somehow. We don't know how. And by the way, we never ask the capitalist quite how he got it, do we? It's really only do you got it or do you not have it? And if you have it, you can be the employer. And if you don't, you can't. The fact that the employer who has it didn't produce it is a nagging problem we prefer not to ask. But we'll come back to it. And you know you can't be an employer because you don't have it. You didn't get it. Somebody else did. So the capitalist brings his hundred. But he uses that up. That's the tools and equipment used up. So that hundred shows up in the chair as half of the 200 that chair is worth. And we know that the chair is worth 200 because in addition to the 100 of stuff used up, there was a hundred more value added by the worker who worked to make the chair that's worth 200. Now, says Marx, and you're going to say it with me because you're going to understand this. Now Marx says, let's see. For the capitalist, he wants to get back what he laid out, the 100. He gave 100 to the production process. So when he sells the chair at 200, he's going to take 100 of it to replace the tools and equipment and raw materials used up in producing the chair. That's how he can keep on being a chair capitalist. That's how he can keep production going. He has to replace the tools, equipment, and raw materials he used up, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. I don't have the time to be Socratic because we don't have enough time. Okay, let's see. So out of the 200 worth of chair, you need to take 100 to replace what you used up. That leaves you with 100 after you sell the chair. What are you going to do with the 100? You could, here we go now, because this is the crucial part. You could take the other hundred and you could give it to the worker. Because after all, it was the worker whose labor added the hundred of value to this stuff to make the two hundred. You could, couldn't you? And the logic would be, gee, the worker added the value. He or she, here we go, folks, should get it. Because he gave it. He created it. He made it happen, he should get it. Do you think that happens in capitalism? No, you don't, do you? We don't give the worker the value added. Ever in capitalism. It's not how it works. You all know that. But I'm putting it kind of right up front and bold for you to deal with. What is it that capitalists do? They divide that hundred into two parts. One part is what we pay the worker. I'll be generous and say 50. Mmm, now you get it. If you made a chair of 200 and you used 100 to replace the tools, equipment, and raw materials you used up, and you used another 50 to pay the workers, that leaves what? 50. Good. Higher math of economics. 50. And Marx called this the surplus. 
It's what the capitalist has left over after he pays out to himself the hundred worth of tools, equipment, and raw materials he contributed that got used up. And he pays the workers. He's got to pay the workers, because if he doesn't, they won't show up anymore and the game is over. So to keep it going, he has to replace the tools and equipment and he has to pay the workers. But he has to pay the workers, here we go folks, less than the value added by the workers when they work. Or to use the technical term economists like, he has to rip the workers off. <laughs> he has to steal from them part of what their labor added. You know what the lesson here is? For those of you who imagined that when you graduate from here, you will get a job, in fact, the only job you will accept is one that pays you what you're worth. Uh, never gonna happen. The condition of your employment is that you produce more by your labor than you get paid. Welcome to the capitalist system. That's how it works. This thing, surplus, that's profits. That's where the profits of enterprise come from. The best way to describe your work in a capitalist enterprise is not that the employer gives you a job, it's that you give your employer the surplus. The giver and the getter are in reversed order from what the language suggests. You are doing wonderful things for your employer and they will keep you in that job exactly as long as you could keep producing a surplus adequate to what they need. Okay? That's step one. Volume one of Capital lays all that out. And for those of you who have never seen this before, no one has ever done this with you before, this simple, took me five minutes. Now you get a taste of that repression that I talked to you about at the beginning. That's what happens in a society which is not allowed to think like this. So from some of you, maybe it's the first time. Let's continue. What does the capitalist do with the surplus? A lot of things. A lot of things. And they're very interesting and they shape the economy. In order for the capitalist to survive, he's got to take this 50 that he appropriates from the worker who produced it, and he's got to make sure it's distributed in society to keep himself in office, to keep himself in the job, to keep the capitalist system going. He has to take steps to make sure that this stuff keeps on happening. He can't, as you might imagine, take the 50 of surplus and have a wonderful evening on the town going to an expensive restaurant and a lovely piece of theater and then a trip to the Bahamas, uh-uh. He wouldn't be a capitalist very long. He's got to make sure that things are taken care of in this society. Let me give you an example. It's possible that these workers, uh, let me be more blunt, that people like you in a job might encounter a person like me in a classroom. Which would mean the next day when you come to work, your attitude might have changed. You would be beginning to understand that at the end of the day of a job that you've had, when you had that funny feeling and spoke to a person right next to you on the way out of the building, you feel vaguely, I don't know, ripped off. Yes, good, you got it. There's a reason why you do. You're actually paying attention. Most people in capitalism feel that way. It doesn't show up in the language. We have to disguise it, so we do. Here's an example. At the end of the working day, on your way home, you stop somewhere before you get home. And you stop in a place where you can sit down and have a drink. And the name of this experience in our culture is called Happy Hour to help you understand what the previous hours aren't. <laughs> it's your happy time, because the other eight hours, to use another technical term, suck, don't they? Don't they? The culture does recognize it. It does. 
It just needs a little help interpreting. So it gets distributed, this surplus. You know what it does? It's taken by capitalists and it's given to, I don't know, let's see some institutions who get distributions of the surplus. In many capitalist societies, capitalists support local churches. Mm. And why might they do that? Because in the church, something is taught that says none of what I've just described is going on. Or maybe they fund a university. Maybe they take a part of the surplus and make a beautiful building, sort of, you know, like um, this one. And why might they do that? Because in the university, like in the church, a completely different story is told about all of this. Let me give you an example. Here's a way to understand economics. Production is a wonderful, harmonious collaboration. The worker brings his labor, the landlord brings the land, and the capitalist brings the money and the equipment and the factory. And they all cooperate to produce the output, and then they divide the revenue earned amongst each of them in proportion to the contribution each has made. You might call this fairsies. This is an economics in which everybody is fairly treated. It, it makes you vibrate with the harmony of it all. That's how we teach economics in the United States. I know that because for 50 years I did that. That's what we taught, because that's what we learned. And that's no accident, because that's a completely different story from this one. In that story, everybody gets in proportion to what they contribute. Fairsies. There's no surplus. There's no ripping off. You've got nobody to be angry at. If you don't have more wealth than you would like, it's your own damn fault that you didn't contribute more. So how can you expect to get more? It's wonderfully comforting. It's like knowing that there's somebody up there who, despite everything else, really likes you even though your best friend doesn't. Okay, it's very important. Here are some other things that have to happen. Suppose these workers, for one way or another, discover they don't like this arrangement. They might decide one day to come into work and say, you know, uh, you're a nice boss and all that, but we're not doing this anymore. You want us to work and add value of 100? We want the 100, because we do it, we add the value, you give us the 100. And the employer says no, and things get kind of ugly. At that point, the employer has an option. <coughs> Very interesting option. He can go and pick up the phone, and he can call a place in town. And he says, you know, I'm getting scared. And very quickly, something interesting happens. A truck or a van leaves an office downtown filled with people in dark blue uniforms who come right to your workplace with a big stick and beat up on these people to help them change their mind. It's called the police. And for the capitalist to do what he does and be what he is, he has to have that phone there. And there has to be a bunch of people in blue uniforms. And there has to be a van. And there has to be an office. And that all costs money. Where do you think that comes from? That's another use of the surplus. Hmm. Let me pick some that aren't so confrontational with you. The capitalist also, in order to be a capitalist, he has to make sure that these hundred value added by workers, that the workers know what they're doing. He wants to be able to hire workers who know how to add and know how to read and know how to take orders. They need, in short, to go to school, to learn those things. And the capitalist knows he has to take a part of the surplus to sustain the school system. So he pays a part of the surplus in taxes to the government to run the schools, to teach the people so they can produce the value added when he hires them. The surplus has to be distributed. Marx goes through all this, by the way. All the different ways the surplus is distributed to keep this system going. And you know what it adds up to, says Marx? The way this surplus is used by the employer who gets the surplus is to keep himself in the dominant position. To keep this system going, and that's what he wants because he's the guy at the top. He's the guy who gets the surplus. He's the guy who knows how to use it in 
such a way as to keep himself in the dominant position, which he's been doing a good job of for 200 years or so that we've had capitalism. Done a good job. What's the implication of this for socialism? What is socialism, given what I've described here? I'm going to answer the question. You're going to see where socialism is now going way different from what it was before. <coughs> socialism now becomes this story, this surplus. But instead of the surplus going from one group of people, the workers, to another group of people, the employers, that's over. The implication of Marxist theory is that a new and different society is one that would say here, in this situation, the workers will still come to work, they'll still add a hundred of value, they'll get 50 for themselves for their wages and their income, but the other 50, the surplus, they get that. They don't give that to anybody else. They take it and collectively, democratically decide what to do with the surplus they themselves produced. That's what socialism is about. That's the end of capitalism. No more capitalists. The workers who produce the surplus, as individual effort outputters, you might say, then collectively and democratically decide what to do with the surplus they have produced. They become, to use a language that as an American you might find easier, they become their own boss, don't they? In the only way that's actually available to them, to become their own boss in a collective way. What is the simple American phrase that captures this? Worker co-op. It's very old. You don't need a new, you don't even need Marxism either. All that Marxism does is provide us with the logic and a roadmap back to capture what it was that made people all through history decide that working cooperatively, producing a worker co-op, is an attractive way to organize work, is an attractive institution to pursue. That's why you have examples of it thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, and right now. But it's going to take off now because it isn't an idiosyncratic, odd, leftover from an earlier period. It is a new direction. So let me conclude with spelling out for you what I've just told you. Socialism, having changed dramatically, is basically saying that what went wrong in the Soviet Union and China was that they never transformed the workplaces. They never created democratic decisions. What they did is substitute private owners of businesses and put in government officials. For the average worker, it didn't mean all that much. They didn't have the workers make the decisions collectively what to do with the surplus they produced. They didn't do that. They substituted planning for markets, they substituted public for private ownership, but they didn't change the micro-level organization. Another way to say it, the co-op represents, like the critique of capitalism here represents, an appeal for the democratization of enterprises, to bring democracy to the workplace. Now, think with me in the final five minutes that I take. Think with me, with me what I am saying. You live in a society that makes a fetish out of claiming that it is a democracy. If democracy means anything, it means that if you're affected by a decision, you have the right to participate in making it. That's why we vote for the mayor, because the mayor of our town makes the decisions that affect us. We have to have influence. Okay, if you believe in democracy, then the first place it should have been instituted is at the workplace. Why? Because that's where you spend most of your adult life. Five out of seven days, when you're an adult, you're at work. And for many of the other hours, you're either recuperating from happy hour or getting ready for, <laughs> or getting ready for work. 
If you believe in democracy, then the workplace would have been the first place you would have instituted it. But you live in a society, the United States of America, which has never had democracy in the workplace. You go to work in a corporation today, there's a group of people, the board of directors, 15, they make all the decisions. What you produce, how you produce, where you produce, and what gets done with the profits you help to produce. You know what your influence is on those decisions? Zilch, nothing. There is no democracy in the workplace. You live in a country that is fighting wars halfway around the world to bring to those countries a democracy we don't have. You wonder why they are critical of us. Are you kidding? You must be kidding. Democratize the enterprise. That means a worker co-op, a democratic way to decide what is done with the surplus that everybody helps to produce. Would it make a difference? Oh boy, would it make a difference. Let's give some examples to end. Suppose over the last 40 years, when this country has been torn apart, as we're seeing in the presidential race and everything else in this country right now, over the last 40 years, this country has been torn apart by, among other things, the exodus of large numbers of companies that left the United States, continue to leave the United States, because they can hire people for much less money over there, particularly in Asia, but not just there. Detroit went from a city in 1970 of two million people, the, the, the showcase of capitalism in America, to a disaster today. The population of Detroit today is 700,000 people. The majority of people driven out of their homes, their jobs, their churches, and their schools. It's a collapsed city. You should, if you've not visited it, visit Detroit. Nothing I say will teach you as well as two hours driving through it. Now, suppose a decision where you locate production was not made by a board of directors looking to make more money, but by a democratic decision of all the workers working there. You think they would have canceled out their jobs? You think they would have moved the factory, destroyed their community? Never happened. The history of this country would have been radically different. Here's another example. At the end of each year, when the company looks at its profits, all the surplus it's gotten out of its workers. Who decides what to do with the profits? It's a wonderful moment for those of you who've never been that place. Imagine yourself for a moment in the, in the Christmas party at the end of the year. Your three quarters drunk CEO gets up on a wobbly table and makes in slurred speech, thank you all of you for having worked so hard to make this a successful year, and then he falls off the chair. Okay? The next morning, that drunk, uh, CEO will get together with his other CEOs, or whatever O's they are, and they will decide what to do with the profits. He will have thanked you for producing it, but participating in the decisions, oh no. And if that decision means closing the factory, you lose your job, tough. If it means using a new technology that pollutes the air that your children breathe, tough. You don't participate. You are excluded. And you know, this kind of comes as a surprise to many of you. Over the last 40 years, as these companies have made really big profits off of your labor, and they sit around the board of directors and the major shareholders, by the way, 20, 30 people usually, and they decide what to do with it, here comes a shock. They've decided to distribute a large part of it to themselves, what a shocker, in very high wages and dividends which go to the shareholders, which is what they are. That's why we have a growing inequality of income in this country. There's no mystery here. This has got nothing to do with education or technology. Stop! This is because we allow a tiny group of people at the top to decide what to do with the surplus we all help to produce, and they give a disproportionate amount to themselves. So we have, on the one hand, the richest people imaginable, and on the other hand, the first generation of American college students who can't get a degree without going into tens of thousands of dollars of debt. You are being ripped off here. And that's what Marxism and socialism have always had as their first thought. Appeal to the people who are the victims of capitalism so that they begin to understand that you can do better than this system. And a worker co-op starts at the bottom and represents a new direction for socialism.
That's why in Bernie Sanders' economic platform, a little bit about co-ops. Not a lot, but he's getting it. It's getting there. If you want an example of, an, of a politician today who's gotten much further, Jeremy Corbyn, Great Britain, the leader of the Labour Party. They have the most, interesting for those of you who follow politics, the most developed understanding of the need to develop a socialist co-op sector separate from and in competition with capitalism is emerging in Great Britain under the leadership of the Labour Party under its new leader, Jeremy Corbyn with concrete policy proposals, which if you're interested, I'll lay out for you when we're done. Socialism is emerging now with a new direction and a new definition. And not the least interesting thing for you to watch in the years ahead in your lifetimes will be the success of this, partly because the entire anti-socialist apparatus is completely focused on what socialism isn't anymore and completely un unprepared to cope with what socialism is now becoming. That's one of the not so good results of a repression of your counter ideology for 50 years. Let me stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. Anybody who has comments, questions, don't hesitate. Everybody can't speak at once, so somebody has to have the courage to start. Good. Shoot. Uh, but I mean, capitalism is fair, right? Because I make that 50, eventually I can have the embodied labor and I'll get to make all the surplus for myself. Well, let me ask you a question. Have you seen a, a, a huge upsurge over history of working people who have become capitalists? Do you, you see a lot of that around you? No. And why might that be? Look at this story I told you. Remember I began at the beginning, I said to you carefully, we're not going to ask how it came to be that the work done in the past to produce the glue and the hammer and the lumber ended up being the property of a particular person. But now you do know, don't you? Because this surplus is how that happens. Surplus is part of the output that people produce that they don't get back it goes into the hands of a person who doesn't produce anything. That's how they accumulate the wealth. The joke is when a capitalist says, hey, I deserve something because I, I contributed this, the answer of the worker is, you thief! You took that from us! And now you want us to allow you to do it again because we were successful in doing it the first time. Hello? There's something wrong in this story. That's what this system is. It means the mass of people produce and a tiny number of people get. Let me give you one example, which ought to really settle this once and for all. The most famous institution in the world that tracks the financial and economic uh, inequalities in the world is a British charity, it's been around a long time, called Oxfam. I'm sure many of you know about it. And you can just go Google OXFAM and all of its reports will be available to you, easily accessible. And once a year they do a study and, and of inequality in the world and they release it usually in February. And so they did again this year. And let me give you just one of the lovely statistics that came out of it. As of the end of 2015, so it's really fresh numbers, the 62, that's, I believe, less people that are in this room right now, the 62 richest people on this earth, most of whom are American, but not all, not at all, but most are American. The 62 richest people together, according to Oxfam, have more wealth that is, together they own more wealth than the bottom half of the population of this planet. That means three and a half billion, with a B, billion people. I rest my case. Case is over. We, we have a system, capitalism, been around for 300 years, came in for the French Revolution where it promised liberty, equality, and fraternity, brotherhood. And what do we got? 
We got something for which the model is the ancient pharaohs of Egypt. What? Let me remind you, the bottom half, three and a half billion people, those are the people who die long before they need to, who don't get the medical care that we know how to deliver to them, who live in housing that's unspeakable, with unsanitary water, whose children die in crazy numbers before they reach the first year of their age. And we have a system in which 62 people have more wealth than what could ameliorate the living conditions of three and a half billion people. Which of you has an ethical, moral, or religious commitment to values of such a system? You preserve capitalism? Why? It rips you off. For those of you, by the way, I noticed a couple of you reacting when I mentioned the debts to go through college. Even in capitalism, you don't need to do that. You don't just live in capitalism here in the United States. You live in a virulent form of it. In Germany, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden, at least those that I know of, they have over the last few years reduced the tuition in colleges to zero. Do you understand that? In Germany, it's not only zero for Germans. Any of you can move to Germany as an American citizen or any other citizen, and you can get free tuition too. You live in a country that has gone the other way. The other way. You now get to spend more money than you used to and rack up debts you never had to before. What? The mystery isn't that this is happening to you. I've tried to explain that. The mystery is that you tolerate it. Not only do you tolerate it, but it's almost like you're being kicked. And in response to the kick, you turn the other way so the next kick can get you someplace else. What? Unless you have very unusual tastes, this is not a good idea. <laughs> not a good idea. 62 people have more wealth than three and a half billion. You want that system? That's the, the end. You all convinced you're going to be one of the 62? Don't hold your breath. Don't hold your breath. And let me ask you another question, if I can. Suppose you make it. How enjoyable is that? How do you enjoy the dinner at one end of the table? rich as it is, if at the other end there's a baby crying of hunger. Does something to your enjoyment, doesn't it? And then again, you can pretend the baby isn't there. And we are specialists in that. Shoot. The same Oxfam report two years earlier showed that it was 80 people owning half of the right. Right, and a few years earlier it was 134. They've been showing the number goes down. So, and then you mentioned inequality. I mean, certainly in the U.S., we know how the income distribution of new, in, you know, of, of new income has just accelerated. You know, has gone. You know, in this growth, people are not getting any growth in their incomes. So, so, so inequality, all of these, you know, is, is exacerbating. Um, you know, if the system is uh, accelerating, is it accelerating to its demise under its own strains? Or are there some concrete things that you see that will transform it? Well, I, I've never been good at predicting. Um, for me, predicting what's going to happen in the future is something you do at the amusement park because it's amusing. You know, when you give a person some money and they tell you who you're going to be sleeping with next week. You giggle and you laugh. If you actually begin to worry that you didn't want to sleep with that person next week, then you're not getting the point of all of this. You know, prediction is, is not a game. So I don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea. I do know, and this may be of interest to you, that there are all kinds of people that are worried about what's going on. I am hardly the only one nor are socialists the only one who see it and worry about it. Warren Buffett, who is light years from a socialist, is worried about it. He's been making 
interesting statements for years now. You remember some of you noticed he made a big deal out of the fact that the rate of taxation he pays is lower than his secretary pays, you know, who, who makes the secretary's income. And he's very worried. And there are all kinds of statements being made by all kinds of people at the tippity top of this society who are very worried that this is a society, that this is an economic system, capitalism, that is killing the goose that laid its golden eggs. It is developing its own opposition. Come on, folks, you're watching it. That's what Mr. Trump represents in his way and Mr. Sanders in his way. And they're doing really well. They are getting millions and millions of people who, despite a relentless barrage from the press, basically portraying both of them as crazy or outside the pale, etc., doesn't work the way it once did. Doesn't convince half or more of the people the way it once kind of did. You're watching the dissolution of this system. That's why I told you about me personally. I'm running around the country giving talks like this everywhere. I'm on radio and television doing it everywhere. I started my little radio program in New York City in March of 2011. We are now five years later. I'm on 52 stations across the United States. What's going on? Suddenly, the critique of our economic system has an audience I've never seen before. I live in Manhattan because I went to those elite universities. I have friends who are right-wing economists and left-wing economists and economists in the middle. We do not agree on how we got into this mess and we do not agree on how we got out. But here's something we all agree on, which surprises us. That this is the worst condition of the American economy in our lifetimes. For those of you that are young, that's not good news. Not about your job, not about your income, not about your future. I do want to make one plug, if you allow me. Actually, two. One, if you're interested in the Marxian theory, if you would like to acquaint yourself with this, one of the books I wrote with a good colleague of mine that Tom, I believe, also studied with, Steve Resnick, um, was recently published which also is a sign of change in the United States. I've published a bunch of books in economics. Each time I published a book, I wrote it, and either by myself or with whoever else I wrote it, I went and asked publishers if they might be interested. The last book I wrote, this one, was a completely new situation for me. Four publishers competed with one another to get us to, to go with them. A very pleasant change, I, uh, I assure you much better position to be in. So we decided to go, for reasons some of you will understand, with the MIT University Press, because MIT has been the premier economics department in this country for most of the last 40 years or so. So here's a book about different economic theories, the neoclassical, the basic theory, the Keynesian theory, and the Marxian theory, published by an impeccable press, the MIT Press, in which you can learn all about Marxian economics. The MIT Press produces this book as a text, and it's used around the country in, t in courses, and it's written by two, get ready, Marxists. No problem. No problem at all. That wasn't true five years ago. That certainly wasn't true ten years ago. It's true now. But this book is, is if you want to learn this in a, in a way that's made accessible, then this is the way to go. If you are interested, in worker co-ops, in terms of their political meaning now is in a capitalism that's in trouble, then I invite you to go over, very simple to a website, democracyatwork.info, and everything you want to know is there, and everything we do is there. I have little flyers here that have the address on them. You're more than welcome to take one uh, when we're over tonight. But this is a movement that's already well underway uh, in this country. There was another person. Yeah. Do you have a particular model for the kind of governance structure of these co-ops? Sure. Equal voting share or something like yes. Good. Very good question. Thank you. So first, worker co-op is not a utopian idea. It's not some lovely image of what could happen in the future. Worker co-op is an existing institution that has existed for many, many years 
in very many parts of the world. So do not imagine we have to start from scratch or we don't have any models or we don't have lots of accumulated experience. We have all of that. There are co-ops all over the United States. I've helped to develop them. I'm going to give you two or three examples to give you an idea of how this works. First, the most successful co worker co-op in the world right now is actually in the country of Spain. It's in the northern part of Spain, if you know the Spanish culture a little bit. It's the Basque country, which is a special group of people with their own language who live in the Pyrenees Mountains on the French side and the, and the Spanish side. On the Spanish side, not the French side, the Basque people uh, lived in terribly poor conditions. And after World War II, after the Spanish Civil War, which was decimated that country, and then World War II, where they suffered as well, uh, by the 1950s, this part of Spain was one of the poorest corners of the world. Very interesting. A Catholic priest, Spain is a Roman Catholic country, a Catholic priest named Father Arismendi made a famous speech to his parishioners. He said, if we wait for a employer, a capitalist, to come in here and give us jobs, we will all die of old age before that happens. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to give ourselves a job. We're going to set up a worker co-op. So Father Arismendi, with the semi-protection of the Roman Catholic Church, interesting historical feature, sets up a co-op with six workers. Now fast forward to 2016, right now. It's called the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation, based in the city, small city of Mondragon in the north of Spain. It has roughly 100,000 workers. It's the biggest co-op in the world. It is the seventh largest corporation in all of Spain. It is a stupefying success. It has shown that workers together as co-ops can run it, because it's by actually a family of, it's a co-op corporation, but think of it almost like a holding company. It's a group of about 200 co-ops that are in manufacturing and services and all kinds of activities. But they are tied together, they share funds, they have a common bank, they have their own university called the Mondragon University, been in existence for decades, teaches an immense array of courses on how to finance a co-op, how to run a co-op, how to grow a co-op, everything you've ever wanted to know, it's all accumulated and set up as a university uh, system. Over those 50 years, as they grew from six to 100,000, they had to compete with capitalist enterprises. You know, the conventional kind with a board of directors, shareholders, and all of that. And in those competitions, they won. They outcompeted the capitalist enterprise. Some of you think that a co-op, somehow everybody's very nice to everybody else, and therefore it won't last. They lasted, they won. They have their own labs where they develop new products and new technologies. Two American corporations are so taken with the labs and the work that they do that they pay the Mondragon Corporation, two American companies do, to have their scientists work alongside of them in their labs so that they can pick up what they're developing because that's how taken they are. I thought you might like to know the name. General Motors and Microsoft. Little companies around the corner. They do that. You won't hear them discuss that they fund the worker co-op. And the people who run the worker co-op in Spain, they are, get ready, socialists. Shh, don't tell anybody. In the Bay Area, any of you here from Bay Area? In the Bay Area, there's a set of five bakeries called the Arismendi Bakeries, named after. They are all co-ops. Here's a couple of things how the, the, the Mondragon Corporation works you might be interested in. The workers, get ready, because this for an American is going to be very hard. The workers hire the managers. That's right. That's, I'm going to do that again. The workers hire the managers, not the other way around. At the end of the year, the workers get together, and if they think the managers did a good job, they keep their job. And if the managers didn't do a good job, they lose their job. Managers exist at the pleasure of the workers. They have another rule. The highest paid person in the Mondragon Corporation cannot get more than eight and a half times what the lowest paid worker does. In this country, co the corporate CEOs get three and four hundred times what the lowest paid worker does. In lovely institutions like uh, Walmart, McDonald's, uh, Victoria's Secret, uh, CVS Pharmacy. It's a wonderful thing if you study uh, what the CEOs get. I do this on my radio program. 
the CEOs of these corporations. You know that the $15 an hour movement in this country is mostly concentrated in the retail industry and the restaurant industry. And if you take a look at what the CEOs get in those industries, they get, for example, CVS, Walmart, uh, L Brands, which is the parent of Victoria's Secret, and uh, so McDonald's. All of their executives, if you work it out for the hours, get paid a little over $9,000 an hour. So, appreciate America. People earning $9,000 an hour do not want to allow their employees to get $15 an hour. And they're determined to make that fight. Wow. Makes you want to go to church, doesn't it? <laughs> This is, it's so deeply moving. Think of the family values that these people are committed to. Wow. So there's loads of examples. And by the way, most of the worker co-ops in this country and in other parts of the world are more than willing to share what they have learned, their mistakes, their achievements, and so, so there's lots of, it's all ready to go. All ready to go. I work. Our organization is called Democracy at Work. We work, by the way, with companies across the United States that want to become worker co-ops. Let me drive that home to you, because you may not understand this. All across America, there are the following. Think of a little business started by Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And they started it 20 years ago, or 40 years ago, or 60 years ago. And they've worked all their lives to build up this business. And they now have 47 employees or 206 employees. And they're very proud. But they've now reached age 66. And their children don't want to carry. Their children are doing something else. What are they going to do? They really have three choices. Choice number one, become a joint stock company. Become, you have an IPO and become a, a joint stock company. But then. You know, you're throwing yourself into the mercy of whoever buys the shares, etc. They don't want to do that. Option number two, they actually have four options. Option number two, they can close the business. They don't have anyone to give it to, so they close it. They don't want to do that. They poured their life into it, and they don't want to screw those people who they all know they built up over the... They don't want that. And they don't want to sell it to another company because they don't know what that company will do the day after the sale is closed. Guess what we do? We arrive on a white horse and we say, we've got another option for you. Sell it to your workers. That keeps the jobs for them. It keeps the business going. It keeps the tax revenue flowing to the town in which this business is located. Here's a whole new way to solve your problem. We're doing this all the time. It's been going on in the United States for quite a while. We partner with a law firm that's been making a living doing this for 30 years. There are workers who come and they want to have a worker co-op, whether the employer wants it or not. But sometimes it's the worker, sometimes it's the employer, sometimes it's both. But the notion that this can't be done or this is something, no, 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 that's not accurate. Let me give you another example of how we get at it. Imagine, because this happens in America every, every week, workers are called in from a store, an office, or a factory. And the boss is there to give a speech. And here's how the speech goes. I'm so glad you all could come, but I am afraid I have bad news. My competitors, our competitors, have moved to Shanghai or Hyderabad or Sao Paulo or wherever, and I can't compete because they're paying low wages. So I'm terribly sorry, but I'm gonna have to close this factory office store and you're all going to lose your jobs unless, of course, you make a whole lot of concessions. That's a fancy term for you take lower wages, you do without benefits, you work longer hours, or, or some combination of all of those things. And in effect, he's saying to his workers, make it worth my while to not leave or else I'm out of here. And you know what happens then? Workers do something which is painful to admit but it's called groveling. They beg. Don't take everything from us. Leave us a little. Okay, we'll do without 10 holidays, we'll have four. 
We'll pay more of our pension. We'll pay more of our medical insurance. We'll, we'll, we'll please stay another year or two, which they may. But now imagine a new union strategy, if there is a union. And I counsel unions about this. Have the meeting, sit on the other side, and say to them when they tell you this speech, have a nice trip. Go. We don't want you. But we're telling you something. By the way, these are moments I really treasure personally. I sit at the table and I say to them, just be aware, dear sir, when you leave, the workers are going to take this building and they're going to take everything in it and they're going to set up a worker co-op and they're going to run around the United States telling every customer, because we know exactly who they are, we're the workers here, we're going to tell every customer, you can buy from the company that abandoned the United States and destroyed this community or you can support the workers co-op who took over this business and you think we're bluffing? I'm going to go tomorrow morning to talk to the mayor and the congressman and the senator and the governor and I'm going to tell them the following speech. Let me tell you, this is fun. I sit down with them and I say, dear governor, you need to help this project. You need to provide financing so that the workers have the money with which to buy this enterprise from the departing company. And you need to give us a tax break. And you need to give us this, 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 and this. And if you do it, we will run around the state saying you saved these jobs. You saved this community. You turned a page against what has been happening across America. You will be very popular. And if you don't, your political career is over. And it'll be over so fast you won't. You know something? I don't even have to finish those sentences. They know exactly what I'm saying about three words in. Do you understand? This is how you do this. Is it doable? Of course it is. It takes only the commitment of a people, of a working class, to change the direction of this system. Yeah, you had some? I'm, I'm, I didn't follow. If uh, co-op, so um, particularly viable, what's, what's the biggest impediment to uh, their growth? Is, is it access to credit? Is it access to credit? Uh, well, there's several. Access to credit has always been a problem. In this country, it's, it's been a problem in a funny way. It's been a problem because the most likely lenders are blocked by law from lending. I'll explain that in a minute. And many of the traditional banks don't know and are frightened by the concept of a co-op. They're normally lending to a corporation that has a certain legal definition and a legal standing. A worker co-op is a, you know, who's exactly responsible? Who do you go collect from if a payment is missed or this kind of thing? Is, it's, a, it's novel. Now both of those systems can be, problems can be gotten around, but for example, the most logical source of credit for a co-op movement in this country are credit unions. They are already halfway there. Credit unions, have, an, if you add them all up, have an enormous amount of money. Just wild amount of money in this country is put by people into credit. You all know what a credit union is. It's, it's usually an association with where you work that functions like a bank but is a collection of everybody pooling their money rather than going to a commercial bank. So, but credit unions are blocked by law from making these kinds of loans that would normally be made to a co-op. They're blocked because the banks, the private banks in America, were successful in lobbying to get the laws because they didn't want to have the competition. The danger to a private bank is that the, the, the credit union can say, we're your fellow workers. You should deposit with us, you should borrow from us. A very powerful advertising message, and they didn't want that competition. That's why we don't have in America a public banking system. Many other capitalist countries have a private banking system alongside of a public banking system. Banks owned and operated by the government. Germany has an immense public banking system, so do most European countries. 
here in the United States, we have one state, North Dakota, that has a public bank. Just a footnote. How many of you know that North Dakota has a public bank? Two or three, okay. The Bank of North Dakota is owned and operated by the state of North Dakota. It is where the, gov the government puts all its money. It deposits it, all the, you know, the taxes people pay and the dog licenses you take out and the fishing licenses and, and the fines you pay the local cops all goes into the public bank, which lends it to North Dakota businesses and North Dakota individuals. It's a public bank serving a public need. Private banks in America, the big ones, uh, Wells Fargo City, have tried to get rid of that for 100 years. It's 100 years old. It's 100 years old. Everybody supports it. The Republicans and Democrats, they disagree on everything. Not that bank. Any party that went against that bank wouldn't be in office more than another six, maybe seven minutes. Be over. They love it. They love it. They've kept it for 100 years. It's the only state in the country that has it. All the others, 49 others, don't. So if you change the laws, if you made it easier to have public banks so that they could compete with the private banks, you know the leaders of private banks always give speeches, it's one of the functions. They give speeches about the enormous, wonderful benefits of competition. Then they spend the rest of the day killing and whatever competition rears its head for them. So the next time you hear one of these speeches, remember that. Anyway, financing is a major problem. Here's another one. Getting customers. You have to win customers. By the way, Mondragon, you know how they solved their financing problem? They have their own bank. It's called the Caya Laboral. It's the, 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 the workers' bank, basically what it means in Spanish. And all the co-ops put their money in that bank, and that then becomes the source of money to start new co-ops. It's the source of money to get co-ops through a rough period, if they have it, and so on. So they solved, because they're big enough, they solved their credit problem internally. And that would mean, if you learn the lesson, that if co-ops get going in a place like the United States, there'll have to be a political movement that coordinates them, help, helps them help each other. And that shouldn't come as anyone's surprise to anybody because that's how capitalism got going. For those of you who don't know it, in most American cities, there's things called the Rotary Club and the Kiwanis Club and the local churches. You know what they are, among other things, whatever else goes on in there? Their networking system for the local, medium, and small capitalists to work out deals amongst each other, which is what they do when they're not golfing. Okay, so for a co-op to begin to do this kind of activity is just to take a book and take a page from how capitalists got going. Here's yet another way to solve that problem. Governments should be funding this. Governments should be funding this. Why? Well, let's go through the reasons. One, governments have funded capitalist enterprises throughout the history of capitalism. Every significant corporation in America spends real resources trying to get tax reductions for itself everywhere it can, subsidies wherever possible, roads built over here because it facilitates what they do, curriculums taught in schools that are the kind they want their future employees to have. We, we, the taxpayers in this country, subsidize a vast array of government subsidies and helps to capitalist enterprises. For co-ops to ask for the same thing is not to ask for anything special. It's in fact to say there shouldn't be a policy that helps one kind of organization of enterprises and doesn't help another. And why not? Well, let's use American ideological language. This is all for freedom of choice. You should all have the following freedom of choice, which you don't have now. You should be able to go buy something and be able to choose between having that be the product of a top-down, hierarchical, undemocratic capitalist enterprise or a worker co-op the next time you buy a t-shirt. Wouldn't it be nice to read on the back on the label, not necessarily just the country in which it was produced, a matter in which you probably don't have that much interest, but you might like to know this is the product of a capitalist undemocratic enterprise or this is the product of a worker co-op. You don't have that choice now. You have the choice whether to buy uh, fair traded coffee, right? 
Some of you do. You go to a coffee place where you buy fair traded coffee, you pay maybe a few pennies more per pound because you want to believe that the peasant who made that coffee wasn't ripped off as badly as they usually are. But here's a chance to have your, a real freedom of choice to support the enterprise you believe in. And here's another freedom of choice. You ought to be able, when you finish high school or college, to choose whether you want to spend your working hours, five out of seven days, in a democratic workplace or not. Right now, your choice is or not. You have any kind of or not you want. But you don't have the option of working in a democratic workplace. The government ought to create a worker co-op sector so that you have that choice. Choice of where you buy and choice of where you work. To give you that freedom of choice, they'd have to develop the sector. Now that allows me to tell you, just got to watch the time, it allows me to tell, how much time do we need to get to the, air, to the train station? 20 minutes. 30 if you don't want to Okay, so let me, let, let, me, let me wrap up by doing what I promised earlier, because it's relevant here, to tell you a little bit about Jeremy Corbyn in the Labor Party in England. They have an official commitment. You might find this interesting. If they get to power, if Mr. Corbyn gets to power, and he just got a wonderful boost this last couple of weeks, when it was, uh, it was revealed that the Panama Papers, I hope some of you read about that, that law firm that creates phony companies in Panama to hide assets, well, it turned out that David Cameron's family, he's the prime minister in England, they made use of that firm and they made use of the phony companies and they hid money and he personally benefited embarrassing. He said he would take great steps to do it. These did not include doing anything about the British Virgin Islands, the Bahamas, and the Bermuda, who does exactly what Panama does, but detail. Mr. Corbyn now looks better for the next election that he did before this was revealed. Here's their position. Any, any enterprise can start in England the way it wants to, the way they always have. People get together, they have some money, or they find some money, they start an enterprise, they can do whatever, they, fine. But if they ever get to the following position, A, they want to go public, have an uh, initial public offering, become a stock company, or they want to sell to another company, something a lot of companies start, they're small, they want to become successful, so another big company buys them out. Here's the law that the Labor Party is committed to. Before a company can go public, and before it can sell itself to another, it has to give what's called the right of first refusal to its own workers to convert the business into a worker co-op and the British government will facilitate and finance the transaction. In order, said John McDonald, the, the, it's the, called the shadow government in England, it's the uh, unofficial Labor Party equivalent of the government, he explained in order to create a worker co-op sector. That is the most advanced policy proposal yet developed by a major political force. The Labor Party is the second party, basically, in Great Britain. Uh, so this is a very important thing. That's the commitment that they have already made. It's quite a bit further than uh, Mr. Sanders has so far at least gone, even though he also talks about worker co-ops. But you do see it's beginning to emerge, and it's emerging on the left, and that's why I gave you that history of where it's coming from. For better or worse, let me conclude with this. For better or worse, we are living, you and I, during a period in which capitalism is, again, I'll use a technical term, very deep doo-doo, <laughs> see, and in trouble. And you will hear endless statements about why that isn't the case, why everything is fine, and that it's always when these things happen, there are the people who insist everything, is, they're insisting even as you cart them away in the disaster, they don't see it. But most Americans now see it, which is why they are acting the way they are. And there is a demand and a hunger for new directions, all the details of which no one ever knows in advance. But this socialism is returning, it's returning big, and it's returning fast, and it's returning in an unrecognizable new set of directions. And that is what I hope you take away 
from what we did this afternoon. Anyway, thank you again very much.